I'm so glad you could come. This is going to be such an exciting day. I hope you enjoy it. I think you will. There are some stories that span generations. We all grow up with them and know them by heart. They're basically ingrained into our cultural consciousness, which raises a question. If we're already so familiar with these stories, why do we keep retelling them in new movies and TV shows? The answer is pretty simple. A lot of you have probably typed it out in the comments already. It's money. But in order to make money, people have to actually watch these things. Maybe the real question is, why are we still watching? What kind of a question is that? No need to snap. Just a question. Before we get into it, be sure to like this video and subscribe to Nerdstalgic for more content just like this. We've all seen the trailer for Wonka, right? No matter how you feel about whatever Timothy Chalamet is doing or the uncanny valley Hugh Grant Oompa Loompa, this movie is undoubtedly going to make a lot of money when it comes out because it's an adaptation of Roald Dahl's Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. The beloved 1964 children's book has been brought to the big screen multiple times over the course of its nearly 60-year existence, and each version has brought something new to the table. Of course, new doesn't always mean good, and it certainly doesn't mean necessary. So if that's the case, why are we enamored with adaptations in general? And why do we look back on both of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory's movie adaptations with fondness? at least for the most part. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Fudge Mountain. The 1971 film Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory hits on some of the more emotional reasons for adaptation. The movie brings the most heartfelt moments of the book to life, and it translates the childlike wonder of the factory to live action in near perfect detail. Gene Wilder's electric and unsettling performance as the titular character, the many memorable sets, the songs we're all still singing, and the endlessly quotable dialogue the strawberries taste like strawberries. The snozberries taste like snozberries. Have made this movie timeless. And yet, there's a dark undercurrent to the making of Willy Wonka that most people tend to ignore. For one thing, Dahl absolutely despised it. Though he is credited as a screenwriter, Dahl lamented the many small changes made to his script. Key moments like the fizzy lifting drinks scene and Slugworth's ultimate role in the story were changed entirely. He wasn't very fond of the added songs or even the director, Mel Stewart. And he also hated the casting of Gene Wilder, who he saw as pretentious and too American. Marshmallows in five seconds. Impossible, my dear lady. That's absurd. Unthinkable. Why? Because that pipe doesn't go to the marshmallow room, it goes to the fudge room. Obviously, creators being unhappy with adaptations of their work is nothing new, but we also have to take into account the premise on which the movie was made in the first place. Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory was produced in part by the Quaker Oats Company, which means that this charming retelling was only put into production in order to sell candy to children. As an audience, we usually want adaptations to make us feel the way the original work did while still getting something new from the experience. A twist in a traditional tale, like a more subdued Wonka or an evil candy spy might make for a fresh perspective on a story. That's part of what makes adaptations so enticing. But as we know, studios and the companies surrounding them are more interested in making money. What do they ask for? They want your case of Wonka bars. Miss Curtis, did you hear me? It's your husband's life or your case of Wonka bars. Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory managed to do it all. For that, we can call it a successful adaptation, even if Dahl would disagree. The real box office money wouldn't come until 2005 with the release of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, starring Johnny Depp and directed by Tim Burton. This is admittedly the stranger of the two adaptations, and it's also the more contentious among viewers. Depp plays Wonka in a way only he can. Mr. Wonka, I'm Violet Beauregard. Oh. I don't care. Love it or hate it, his unhinged energy is by far the most memorable part of the whole movie. Since this is a Tim Burton production, there's a whole subplot about Wonka's daddy issues featuring the way overqualified Christopher Lee. Every single Oompa Loompa is played by Deep Roy, and the nightmarish squirrel scene is rivaled only by the one in the 2013 Broadway musical. Still, most of the effects hold up surprisingly well with one or two notable exceptions, and it's arguably a much more faithful adaptation than the 1971 film, especially when you take into account the whimsical and sometimes eerie illustrations from the original book. Dahl's wife, Felicity, has even openly stated that her husband would have loved the movie and Depp's portrayal of Wonka. Now, she may be stuck in the chute just below the top. If that's the case, all you have to do is just reach in and pull her out. 
With this in mind, 2005's Charlie and the Chocolate Factory gives us a very different reason for adaptation. The need for faithful recreations of source material translated into other mediums. This brings a classic story in its truest possible form to a new audience one that may not have experienced the story otherwise, and those that have experienced the story get to see it with fresh eyes in a new format. There's something to be said about this method of cataloging and preserving stories, but even the most impeccably detailed adaptation is bound to miss something. Just as 1971's Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory may have inspired similar feelings to the book for the audience, yet missed the mark when it came to its creator's intent. In each case, viewers can either be excited or infuriated depending on what they're looking for out of their adaptations. It's obvious that the practice of retelling these stories has just as many backdraws as it does benefits. Other adaptations manage to surpass their source material in quality, while some are so bad they're actually offensive to the property they're adapting. For every incredible return of the king, there is a disappointing golden compass. The worst offenders are the ones that simply don't need to exist. There are countless examples of an original work being adapted flawlessly, which inspires a whole line of poorer quality imitations of the same property. Snow White, A Christmas Carol, Alice in Wonderland, The Three Musketeers, even Winnie the Pooh hasn't escaped this fate. Nobody wins in this situation. So you get nothing. You lose! Good day, sir! Particularly not anyone who might be trying to get a new idea off the ground while they're being weighed down by the slush pile of remakes on the desk of every executive in Hollywood. The 1971 and the 2005 Charlie and the Chocolate Factory adaptations meet some of those nebulous demands. Your mileage may vary on which one you prefer, but they both have their merits. 2023's will likely experience a similar fate for a new generation of filmgoers. The upcoming Wonka promises to be a prequel to the story we know all too well, an approach that will no doubt attempt to play on our nostalgic heartstrings if writer-director Paul King has anything to say about it. The man brought us the Paddington movies, after all. And while the trailer's inspiring score, colorful visuals are easy to get swept up in, we're still left wondering whether we actually need this. There are stories out there that are totally untethered from any existing IP. They've been waiting in line for their shot while more adaptations get shunted to the front. Why don't we give something new a chance before we commit ourselves to a train bound for repetition? Once again, the answer is pretty simple, but it's also our own fascination with the familiar. We can't stop the adaptation train, and we as a collective audience have already bought our tickets to ride but maybe we can get off at the next stop when something truly new and creative catches our eye. That's it for today's video. Thanks so much for sticking with it all the way to the end. If you enjoyed what you saw, be sure to hit the thumbs up button and subscribe to Nerdstalgic so you don't miss our latest releases.